Welcome. Today I'm going to do an intro to 6502 assembly programming. Um, assembly programming is programming where you're manipulating, you're getting right down to the hardware and talking to the CPU and programming actual instructions into the CPU step by step. Um, it's basically as close down to the hardware as you can get. 6502 is a mini is a microprocessor that was designed around the late 70s early 80s um, by Chuck Peddle and was used in a lot of 1980s computers. Um, it's actually I should say the 6502 family because there was also the 6510 which was used in uh, the Commodore 64, the 8502 which was in the 128 uh, the 6502 itself was used in the uh, the first Nintendo game system, I believe, and basically a lot of the computers of the time. Um, now, why would you still want to program it? Uh, because they're still being made. They're actually very popular um, in hobby systems and embedded systems. So a lot of the um, embedded stuff that's coming out now that just needs a small easy to you know, cheap and easy to program CPU and doesn't need tremendous speed or anything like that uh, 6502 or something in the, in this family uh, there's several others in the family but um, can actually be a pretty good choice so it's still still out there um, it was originally designed to be a cheap um, easy to program CPU to build a computer around and it still is for some uses so to program the 6502 in assembly, the first thing you have to understand is the hardware to some extent, um, because you are actually programming the hardware. So we'll start with the RAM. Um, the RAM in most of these systems is a 64K block of RAM. That's what the CPU can see at one time. Some of the machines would have more than that, but they'd have a way to bank it in and out. So the processor itself is seeing a 64K string of uh, memory locations um, and they're all numbered they're, they have an address from 0000 to FFFF now I'm going to be using hexadecimal numbers here if you don't understand hexadecimal and you want to get into set to assembly language um, hexadecimal is something you'll want to learn because it's computers work in binary and hexadecimal is just a, an easier way to read binary. Um, and if you try to, I, I've seen tutorials that'll say, well, you don't need to learn it because you can just translate with a calculator or something. It's it's not worth that much trouble. You just it's it's worth just learning hexadecimal. But each one of these locations, then 65,536 of them, holds an eight-bit value. And that value can be, you know, just any, any assortment of eight bits, ones and zeros. And so there's, you know, 65,536 of them. And each one has an address. And so, you know, the very first one's address is 0000. And you come on down. And so on. Down to the, down to the last one, which is FFFF. So that's the RAM that would be on your on your motherboard or on a stick or something like that. And that that concept basically is still the way it still works. We just have lots more of it now than we did back then. Now in the CPU, you have several storage locations which are used to actually do the work of the computer. And the first one is the program counter. This one is actually 16 bits wide, or it, it, it's, I think it's actually two 8-bit registers put together. A register is just what we call a, a storage location in the CPU that CPU can use to do work, store values in, that kind of thing. Um, the program counter then is a 16-bit value because you need 16 bits to hold an address. Um, any, one, any one of these addresses can be stored in 16 bits. So the program counter always holds the value of the address of the next uh, command that is going to be run. So let's say you have a program that's stored at 1300 here. So your program starts right there at 1300. 
then the program counter is going to be holding 1300 as its value for your program to start and it's going to run the first and that way it'll, it'll run the first instruction that's sitting right there and then the program counter will look ahead to the next instruction and it just keeps walking its way through. Next one would be the stack pointer. The next register. Oh by the way this is abbreviated PC SP. Okay. The stack pointer is similar to the program counter except it's only 8 bits wide which means it can only see a 256k chunk of memory and the stack pointer is always pointing to just some location in that chunk. Now on the Commodore machines the stack was in between um, 0100 and 01FF. So the stack pointer, let's say the stack pointer's value was D1, then that would mean the stack was currently at 0, well, I shouldn't draw it in there, that's where the values go, but the stack was currently pointing to 01D1. And the purpose of the stack, I'll, I'll probably come back to this somewhat later, but the purpose of the stack is as a, a place to temporarily stash data, to temporarily stash values. And it works like a, like a stack of dishes. So, let's say you're, let me blow up the stack here. We've got 0, 1, 0, 0, down to 0, 1, FF. Okay. If you push a value in, let's say you push in the value 5, and the stack pointer was pointing right here, well then the stack pointer moves up to the next spot. And then let's say you push in the value 7, the stack pointer moves up to the next spot. You push in the value 10, it moves up to the next spot. Well then if you pull a value back out, it always takes the one off the top. So if you pull the 10 back out, then it moves the stack pointer down to point at the 7. So the stack pointer is always moving up and down when you push and pop values off on and off the stack. And so it's just a convenient way to stash some numbers away and then get them back when you want them. And it's, and it's a fairly fast way to do it because it's built in with the stack pointer. Okay, then there is a status register. And I'll, I'll come back to more on the stack later. So the status register, which is only SR, this one isn't really a value so much as it's just a group of flags. Each flag is a single bit. So let's say you have those, those bits in it. Each one, except for one that's not used, each one is a flag to tell you whether something is or isn't true. Um, one of these is a carry bit, which tells you whether the last instruction that was executed caused a carry, which a carry in binary is just like a carry in decimal. You know, if you add 23 plus 18, and, you know, if you're, if you're just learning to add, you say 3 plus 8 is 11, so there's one, carry the 1, 4. Well, that carry is just is the same thing inside the computer. When it needs to carry, it sets the carry flag. And then there's a zero flag. The zero flag gets set any time the last instruction resulted in a zero. And then there's there's other flags here, but the others, the others aren't used nearly as much as the carry flag and the zero flag. Um, so I'm not gonna go into those right now. Now the thing about these three registers is you don't usually manipulate these three directly yourself. There are a couple of commands you can do it with, but in normal programming you don't do that. Normally you just let the program counter do its thing, working its way down through the program. You let the stack pointer do its thing when you push and pop values. And you just, you, you just, you just check flags in the status register with certain commands. You don't put a value in the status register as a whole usually. So, Usually you don't, you don't touch these directly, you just let them do their work. And there are other three other registers that you do touch directly, fortunately, so you've got somewhere to do your work. I don't, I guess I shouldn't draw them bigger because they're, they're also 8 bits. First one would be the accumulator. It's called the accumulator because the values accumulate in it. You can use it to add and subtract, which is basically the only math your this CPU is capable of doing 
everything else is a combination of that. Um, and it's usually abbreviated just A. So, the accumulator is A. The accumulator is the main register of the CPU. It's the one that most, it's the one that you have the most commands you can do, the most instructions you can do to it. Um, it's, like I said, it's the one that can add and subtract, and so it, it's the one you use the most. Then you also have two others called X and Y. Now X and Y can also do some of the things the accumulator does, but not everything. You can't add or subtract in X and Y. You can increment them and decrement them. You can add one to them or subtract one. Um, but you can't, you can't add and subtract other numbers. You can't roll them left and right, those kinds of things. Um, one thing that's useful, that's basically necessary, is that you can use them in combination with the accumulator in certain commands and uh, as an index, and we'll get into that when I get into the commands. Now you can, with all three of these then, th this, is, this is it. This is the CPU. We've got other, you got other electronic stuff out here going on, but this is the stuff you actually deal with as a programmer. And basically using the re these three values, these three registers, and then the ability to move things from these three registers to memory and out of memory into the registers and add and subtract and so on, that is how you make the computer do things. And, you know, this is all you need to build a game or a database or, you know, whatever. Um, and there, you know, there's wiring in between all this called buses. There's an address bus and a data bus that allow values to move back and forth between the registers and so on. Okay, so the next question would be, once you know about this hardware, how do you program it? How do you use it? Well, <coughs> that's where the assembly language comes in. Um, way, way back, they used to have to use the punch cards that you may have seen or heard of. And a punch card was actually just binary punched into a card. Whether whether the hole was punched out or not determined whether it was a one or a zero. And so they actually had to program by saying, okay, I want the next instruction to be one 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 zero zero one one or something like that. And they had to actually work that stuff all out. Well, an assembler figures that much out for you. And so we have what are called um, opcodes. That's the word I'm looking for, opcodes. We have codes, basically. We have instructions that are a little easier to remember than series of ones and zeros, but they get translated into ones and zeros. So that's what assembly language is about, mostly. So for instance, you have load commands. You can load A with, let's say we just want to load a number directly into A, you can just say load A5. And you have to put a, if you just want to load a number, you put a, a hash sign in front of it. This just takes the number 5 and puts it in the accumulator. And you can do the same thing with load X and load Y. You can load numbers directly into them. Okay. So that would just take the number 4 and put it in the X register. This would just take the number 25 and put it in the Y register. You can also load these from addresses in memory. If you don't put a hash sign in front of it and you just give an address in memory, now you're loading A from this location in RAM. So you're, taking, you're getting the value from here and copying it into A. It's, it's not destroyed over here, by the way. It's just copied when you load. Okay, so you've got load commands for all that kind of stuff. And then the opposite of the load command is the store command. So the store A, 2000, that would then take the value that's in the accumulator, whatever it is right now, and store it at the location 2000. And you can store X and store Y as well. Now, you can get a little more complicated with those then. You can load a, say, 2000, comma, x. Now, this is where I talked about using two registers together. In this case, x is being used as an index. 
And so what this does is it says, okay, here's the address 2000. I'm going to add X to it. So let's say X currently has, has uh, let's just make it 5. Let's say X currently has 5. Then it's going to go out to the memory location 2005 and grab the value from there and put it in the accumulator. And this, uh, this allows you to do a lot of stuff, a lot of looping and things that you couldn't do without this indexing ability. Or at least that you couldn't do nearly as fast and easy as this CPU can do it. So when you do an index, you're just saying 2000 plus whatever is currently an X. And you can do that with Y as well, where you use Y as your index. And so you've, you can, you've always got X and Y here both available to do that kind of indexing thing with. And you can do the same, you can also store the same way. If you want to store something, you can index with Y. So say Y is 8. This is going to take the accumulator value and store it into 2008 over here. There are some more complicated methods of indexing that I won't get into right now because I'm not trying to necessarily teach every every assembly instruction right now. I'm just trying to give kind of an overview of them. But those are the way those are some of the ways you can move values from your registers to RAM and back. Um, now moving between the registers, you can do that. You can transfer from A to X, transfer from X to A transfer from A to Y, etc. You can transfer between all three, um, which is just what it sounds like. You're just copying value from one register to another. I talked before about the stack pointer. You can push, push the value in A into the stack, or onto the stack, I should say, onto the top of the stack. And you can pull the value off the top of the stack, whichever one happens to be on top, pull it back into the accumulator. And that's how you deal with the stack. And then the stack pointer just takes care of itself. That's all done under the hood with these commands. So you just, if you just want to store something in the stack for a second, say you, you need to do some adding in the accumulator, but you got a value in the accumulator you don't want to lose, you can push it on the stack, do your adding, then when that's done, store the, store the result somewhere or whatever, pull the accumulator value that you wanted to save back off the stack. So that's one of the one of the purposes of the stack. You can also do stuff in the accumulator with the bits that are in it by shifting them. Like um, roll, I think I've got that right. There, all the instructions in, C, in 6502 assembly are three letters, so it makes it a little easy to um, remember them. But, Roll left, rotate left means take all the bits in the accumulator, rotate them one spot left, and the one on the left end goes around to the right. So if it did hold one zero one zero one 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 one, everything's going to roll rotate left. The one from over here is going to come around here, and then you're going to have this value, which is almost multiplying by two, but not quite. If you want to multiply by two, you use accumulator shift left which just shifts left, but then it pulls the carry flag in at the end here. And so as long as the carry flag is clear, you have multiplied by two. So that's a, that's a fast way to multiply by two. Um, since the CPU doesn't have a multiplication command at all, um, you can do some multiplying and dividing by two just by shifting, which is very fast. Um, and these also have a right equivalent. So you can rotate right, or shift right, and if you rotate right, the one on the right comes around to the left. If you just shift right, it's just lost. Um, and that divides by two. Uh, let's see. As far as where you are in memory, if you want to jump to a different location, there's a jump command, which say your say your program is at 1300 and you're coming along and then you want to jump to other code that's down in here somewhere you can give a you can give an address and just jump to that address and what that really does is it just sticks this in the program counter so the program counter will go down to that address to get the next instruction there's also JSR which is jump to subroutine the difference with that is this just jumps and, and forgets where it was this pushes 
the current the current location, the current program counter, it pushes it onto the stack, goes to the new location, and then when you hit an RTS, a return uh, return from a subroutine, I, I don't know what the RTS stands for, but return. When it returns then, it returns back to where you were before. So this is just a way to, you can divide your code up into subroutines so that you don't just have one long string of instructions, which would just be about impossible to do. Um, so that's how you can move around and, and move around in your program and run different bits of code. Um, let's see, what have we got? What else have we got? Um, like I said before, you can increment your index and decrement them. So increment x just adds 1 to x, so if it's 5 it becomes 6. Decrement x subtracts 1 from it. You can also increment y and decrement y. And those those come into those come in handy especially when you want to loop because let's say you want to just do something 10 times. Okay. Well, you load x. This would be one way to do it. Load x with 10, which well, I'll just leave it in decimal. Load x with 10, and then let's say this is, our program is starting at 1300. Okay. Then the next instruction is going to be at 1302, which I, I won't get into why, why that is, but the next instruction will be at 1302, and Let's say you're, you're going to do some stuff here. Whatever the stuff is you want to do 10 times, you're going to do it here. And you're not going to affect, you're not going to do anything with the X register. You're going to leave it alone because it's your looping number. Then when you get done doing the stuff that you want to do 10 times, you're going to decrement X. And then you're going to branch if not equal to 1302. And then the program goes on. Okay, what happens here is, okay, you've loaded the value of 10 into the X register. And so, we've got 10 in here, which in, uh, in hexadecimal, that's OA. Alright. Then you do some stuff, you do some work, you get down here, you decrement X, and so X is now 9. Then you do a branch if not equal. Now this means branch if not equal to 0. And remember I talked about the zero flag over here before. The zero flag is going to be set if the very last instruction resulted in a zero. Well, decrementing 10 to 9 does not result in a zero. So it's not equal to zero. And so the branch then is going to branch to 1302, which is right back up here. Then it's going to do the stuff again, the stuff here. Then it's going to decrement x again. And so x is going to turn into 8. Then it's going to check for zero again. Still not a zero, so it's going to branch back to 1302. Eventually, after you know nine times through the loop, this will be one, zero, one. It's going to decrement it. It's going to become zero. Now the branch, if not equal, will fail because it is equal to zero. The zero flag will be set, and so it'll fall through this and go on with the rest of the program. So that's how you do a loop in assembly language, and that's why you that's why you these are often called counting registers or loop registers, that kind of thing, because you can use them this way to loop. And uh, also you can use them as an index then as you're going through the loop. If you want to use if you want to use this number as you're going through the loop, like if you're printing out the numbers one through you know one through ten or something like that, you can use that as you go. Um, and so there are a few branch commands like that. You have branch if not equal, if not equal to zero. Um, branch if equal, I think that's the, yeah, I think that's the opcode. Op Excuse me. Um, you have branch if carry clear and branch if carry set. Those are the same kind of thing that, except that it's checking the carry flag. So if you want to branch different places in your code depending on whether the last instruction involved a carry, you can do that. Um, depending on whether it's set or clear. There are a few other branch ones. These are the main ones that you use most of the time. Um, 
there's there's few others that use other status flags, but they just aren't as commonly used. These are the main ones that you use, especially the especially the one that's based on the zero flag. Um, some other things you can do. There, there are I think 56 opcodes, but there's 20 some that you really use most of the time. There's some that you might never use. So I'm just trying to stick to the main ones. Um, you can add, which is called add with carry. What add with carry does, let's say you, you add with carry 2400. Zero, zero. What this is gonna do is it's gonna take the current value in the accumulator, let's say A, whatever is in there, and it's going to add to it the value that's over here at 2400. So it's going to grab this value from in here. Let's say the accumulator currently holds um, 24 and hex. And what's over here is 13 and hex, and it doesn't matter, but then you're going to add those two together. You're going to add together what's in the accumulator and what's stored at location 2400, you're going to get 37, and that's going to be put in the accumulator. So the result of the add with carry is always left in the accumulator when it's done. Now it's called add with carry because it also pulls in the carry flag, so it's actually adding the value of A, the value at 24, so the value of A goes in, which is 37, or oh, what was it before? It was 24. The value at 200, the value at 2400 goes in, and the value of the carry flag goes in. And so, if the carry flag was zero, it gets added up, and the accumulator becomes 37. If the carry flag was one, which those are the only possibilities, then the accumulator is going to have 38. Now you might say, why would you ever, you know, that's going to be wrong. Why would you ever want to do that? Well, for the same reason you do that when you're adding, you know, 13 and 18. Let's say, let's make that longer. Let's say you're adding um, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight. Okay, you add the first two, then you've got a carry. Well, then you add in the carry with the next two. So you get 12, then you've got a carry again. Then you add with carry. So it's the same thing with in, in the computer, in binary math. If you need to add multiple bytes together, you have to keep carrying to the next one. And so generally, before you add, you always clear carry. That clears the carry flag before you do any adding. But then if you need to do multiple adds in a row because you're adding, you're adding a series of bytes, the carry flag can continue on just the same way it does here. And then you have the equivalent subtract with carry, which is just the opposite. This takes the value in the accumulator, subtracts the value that's over here from it, so in this case, we've got 37, we're going to subtract 13, and we're going to be left with 24, which is going to be put back in the accumulator. And if there was a carry value, that gets, that gets subtracted, or well, I guess it, it gets added in. Let me th uh, let me th I'd have to think about that, but anyway, it, it just works in reverse from the add with carry. And that way you can also subtract a series of bytes in a row and the carry, depending, you know, depending on whether there was a... Well, in subtraction you call it borrowing, but in, as far as the chip is concerned, all subtraction is actually addition. Um, I won't get into two's complement negative numbers right now, but... Um, subtraction is really just adding a negative number, and so it still thinks of it as carrying. We, we think of it as borrowing. But anyway, the point is, it works. Um, let's see, what else do we have? I might be getting close to all of them. I'm probably forgetting something, but I think that gives you kind of an overview of some of the commands. Like I said, there aren't that many. Um, there are multiple ways to use them in some cases. Like I said, you know, if you are adding, you can add just a number. If you just want to add the number 5 to the accumulator, that's one type of addressing. You can add a number that's located off in memory somewhere. That's another type. You can load a number that's in memory and indexed with one of the other registers. So that's an, another type yet. You can do something called indirect addressing. 
where you put parentheses around this. You know, this is this is extra interesting. Let's make this 2401. Um, or no, no, no. Let's leave it 2400. What this does is this goes out and it gets the value at 2400, and it also gets the value at 2401. It makes an address out of those two values, and then it uses that value to figure out where to get the value it's going to use. So let me give just an example of that. Um, you don't use this as often as the other things, but you do use it now and then. It's handy for certain things. And it kind of gives you an example of how you can get a little more complex than some of the stuff I've showed. So let's say at 2400 then, the values are 13, and then at 2401, the value is 58. What this is going to do is it's going to go here and it's going to get this as the low byte and this as the high byte of an address, which means the address then is going to be 5813. And this is going to become, it's going to be like as if this was the command you actually did. It's actually then going to go to location 5813 in memory and get that value and load it into the accumulator. And this is useful for it, for, for a few things, but um, for tables, for one thing, if you want to have a table of locations and then jump to them or load values out of them, that kind of thing. Um, but it's called in, indirect addressing. And there's a, there's a few other methods, but those that covers the main ones. Um, gosh, I think I've covered most of the, most of the common opcodes, um, probably forgetting something, but that kind of, I think that gives you an idea. So when you program an assembly, you're just stringing things like that together, and like I said, it gets down to a very low-level way of looking at it that I need to take, you know, say you just, you want to put a letter on the screen. Well, you've got to take the code for that letter, say the letter A, which on the Commodore 64 is 41, you've got to take that code and put it in the accumulator, or you can put it in one of these, but usually you use the accumulator if it's not busy. So you load A with the value 41, and then wherever you want to put it on the screen, which screen memory in the Commodore is between 400 and um, somewhere around 7FF, but I don't know exactly where it ends, but Let's say you want to put it in the very first location on the screen. You load it. You load 41 in the accumulator, and then you store that into location 400. And then you've got a. Actually, I might have the wrong code there, but anyway, that would put that whatever that character is would put it into the top left location on the screen. And that's basically what everything is. If you want to, you know, if you want to put something, if you want to change colors, that's another location in memory, and so part of part of learning to program it is figuring out, or, or learning the memory map, because there are locations in memory, especially up here in this very first block, what we call zero page, um, that control certain things the computer's doing. And so you've got to be able to, you know, look those things up or keep track of, of where they are. But that's basically what you're doing, and this is what every program it, on some level gets boiled down to is moving values between these registers and the and the RAM and doing adding and subtracting. Like I said, there's no multiply and there's if you if you need to multiply, guess how you multiply? Well, you start adding. If you want to, you, know, you have to think back to when you first learned to multiply, and they said, okay, three times five means. 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 that's how you multiply you start you start looping you would loop five times and each time you would add three to the accumulator um, dividing is the same way you, you divide by subtracting um, if you need to do some if you need to do squares and stuff like that well you just you have to figure out how to do it um, but it all it, it's all done on some level with adding and subtracting bits and pushing them around. And you know, you do enough of it, you've got a you've got a game people play or a, or a program people use. So, 
I think I'm going to quit there. I think that's enough of an intro. Um, I'm going to be doing some uh, actual programming videos where I'm going to start writing a program. Um, haven't decided exactly what yet, but um, I thought I could use a little more of that sort of thing out there. So um, I'm just hoping this serves as a kind of an intro to it so you have some idea of what I'm doing once I actually dive into the code. And uh, hope this will be useful or entertaining or something along those lines. So thanks for watching.